perhaps I should explain, Covey is a, a Danish-based company, and uh, the Danes have a different way of uh, pronouncing the letter W to uh, those of us this side of the North Sea. Uh, I'm here to give a, a slightly different perspective, I suppose, um, but actually there's two perspectives, I think, that, that come to mind for me. Um, the first one is the perspective as a local. I live very close to here, it, by most measures, but I live due south of here, just a little bit south of Ebbsfleet, not far at all on the, uh, on the map as the crow flies. But it took me almost half an hour to get here this morning in a petrol-powered vehicle coming across the Dartford Crossing. And I was just thinking that was a really good illustration of the, the importance of connectivity and, and what we can do with public transport, because uh, certainly the, the Kennex scheme, as has been talked about, would provide a completely logical option for me here. But of course, there's an obstruction in the way, and that's really the, the second perspective I want to bring on it, solutions to that obstruction. I'm a tunneler by trade. I've spent my pretty much my whole career planning, designing, constructing, maintaining, operating transport tunnels. It's a fairly niche market, but there's a few of us around who, who do this sort of thing. And I just want to share some thinking about what, as tunneling engineers, we can bring and perhaps help you as a a community developing tram schemes to deliver the infrastructure that would give us that public transport connectivity that would have so benefited me this morning. So I'm going to talk about three things really. Uh, just a little bit about tunnelling under the Thames in general because I think there's some really important messages there. Then a, a bit about immersed tube tunnel technology because we think that's very relevant to what we're talking about here, and then just a few thoughts on the technical challenges um, that lie ahead of us just in our industry. So let, let's just start with a, a few thoughts about tunnelling under the Thames. The Thames is a, a special place for, for tunnellers, if you like. Um, the images I was going to show you next were uh, going to take us back almost 200 years, I think 197 years in engineering history, uh, and to the, uh, the activities, the, the projects of the Brunels, both father and son. And famously, they set out to try and tunnel under the river. Uh, this was a rather hive in uh, relatively central London. And there was great demand to cross the river, somewhat less, uh, less bridge crossings than uh, we have today. At the time the Brunels were trying to cross the river, there was no established way of doing that. They had to uh, work out how to do it from first principles. And it took them a long time. We, <laughs> we seem to be at the other end of the slide. Yeah. <laughs> But they developed a tunnelling machine, uh, a tunnelling shield, uh, which was quite a remarkable piece of engineering. Hopefully we'll, we'll see a picture in a moment, uh, a drawing of it. Um, but what it consisted of was uh, essentially a, a cast iron frame at the front that supported the ground and provided a series of cells in which men could work. And, and the men actually individually dug out the ground in front of them by hand but the, the cast iron frame provided protection and stopped it all coming in on them. And then just behind them, they built a tunnel lining by having a, a gang of bricklayers, essentially, um, laying the bricks as they went. And the, the frame at the front, the tunnelling shield, advanced forward as they dug the ground by being jacked off the brick lining they built behind them. And essentially, that's exactly what most modern tunnelling machines do to this day. They excavate at the front, they push forward off the lining that's just been built. So we've got a lot of heritage of crossing the Thames in, in my industry. And uh, 
from that, we, we've gone on, we've done much more sophisticated things in some ways, but we've, we've developed the same basic principles and come up with a whole range of tunneled infrastructure. Hopefully in a minute we'll, we'll flick on to um, some drawings of that, or some illustrations. I'm just trying to get an idea. <laughs> okay. There are some other notable things that were done under the Thames for the first time, and one of them was actually putting uh, rails into a tunnel and creating a, a passenger rail vehicle route under the river. That was done in the late 1860s, just alongside the Tower of London. Um, it's not a railway these days, that tunnel. It, in fact, it was very short-lived as a railway service. Um, these days it carries telecoms cables in and out of the city, which is... Uh, perhaps a reflection of the times. And um, again, it demonstrates we've got a lot of history of crossing this river. Today, as we speak, there are dozens and dozens of tunnels that go under the Thames. They carry all sorts of different things. Uh, I would have put up uh, a version of the, the tube diagram that's familiar to probably all of us. Uh, and there's one geographical feature uh, that is actually represented on that diagram, and that is the River Thames. And you can see from it that many of the railways cross the river, and many of them do it in tunnels. Typically, those tunnels, a lot of them around 120 years old now, that sort of order. But there's also tunnels for, for other purposes. There are sewers and water supply tunnels, and there are gas pipelines, there are electricity cables, there are footpaths um, constructed in tunnels. We, we've used many different types of, uh, or we've used tunnels for many different types of infrastructure to make the crossing. So lots of heritage, lots of experience. Why have we uh, been able to do that in London? Why does London and increasingly the river downstream from London have so many tunnels? Well, it is, it, it's not completely uh, at random, as it were. It's obviously partly a reflection of demand in the southeast of the country to cross the river. But it's also a reflection on the ground conditions. Uh, London famously has the London clay, which has been a very friendly medium for, for tunnel construction. As we come through the east of London and into the estuary, we meet the chalk far more. But again, it's a, a fairly favourable material. So these have been good, good conditions for us to work in. Maybe in a minute we'll uh, we'll get some yeah, pictures. Yeah, I'm to get it up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'd quite like the ones in the next section in just a minute to explain something. Yeah. Out of all that, sort of nearly two centuries of development, though, we we have created options. We have different technologies. We have different ways of creating tunnels. Uh, and there were four main groups that um, sort of come to mind. There are the traditional bored tunnels, like a large part of the London Underground. These are tunnels that are actually created by mining a hole, digging out at depth, leaving the ground in situ above you. So there are bored tunnels, and that's what most of the tunnels under the Thames currently are. Then, not under the river, but in other areas, we have a lot of what are known as cut and cover tunnels and essentially those involve digging a trench, building the tunnel structure within it and then covering it over and reinstating the surface. Obviously that comes at a price in terms of uh, some environmental disruption during the works. Then there's a third category of tunnels which is what I was going to mainly talk about which are immersed tube tunnels. Um, come back to them in a minute. And then there are a few other, um, perhaps a bit wacky, some would say, ideas that are being developed. The most notable one um, being pushed for by uh, some of our Norwegian colleagues being floating tunnel solutions. Uh, the Norwegians have a particular problem crossing the fjords to uh, create better transport connections down the, the west side of the country. Uh, and they have been developing various schemes for, for creating tunnels which float, 
not at the surface, but suspended perhaps 30, 50 metres down below the surface. The Norwegian fjords are very deep, so they don't want to have to tunnel hundreds of metres down and back up. They want to keep the, the alignment with their roots quite as level as they can. Oh, good, thank you. That's fine. Um, just uh, talk about the Norwegians. I'll, I'll go back one. Here's, here's the four categories of tunnels I was just describing. Um, and what I was just talking about is on the, the bottom right there, the, the immersed floating tube concept, which is quite a serious proposition being developed in Scandinavia, but probably not quite appropriate to the, uh, the tidal Thames. So, moving on to immersed tube tunnels. Uh, I'm going to focus on these because they, they do appear to offer a very strong prospect for a, a tram crossing in this sort of part of the world. So what is an immersed tube tunnel? Well, essentially this is a, a little sequence of drawings um, illustrating the construction process for an immersed tube tunnel. So in the top left, number one, we have the sort of the situation before we start, the sea or the river, um, and the riverbed below. And the idea is to create a tunnel that sits just below the bed of the, the waterway, because generally you get ships and things in the waterway, you don't want to build something that stands proud. So you start off, number two, by dredging out the, uh, the seabed, the riverbed, creating the space that you need. Separately, somewhere else, typically in a, uh, perhaps a dry dock in a harbour, um, or a, sometimes a dedicated casting facility, you create the sections of the tunnel. So the tunnel is actually fabricated somewhere away from where you're going to build it. And then the sections are floated in, the ends are sealed, so you've got a, a sealed tube um, with, which you can retain air in, and it will float, and you bring it out to the site. Then, once you've got the, the tube section up in number four, um, over the trench that you've already created, you allow the, the segment to essentially drop under gravity. You do that by filling ballast tanks within it and sinking it. And you can sink it down into its final position in the trench in the bed. Once you have it there, you uh, usually infill under it with, with sand or fine gravel, um, create a stable foundation, and finally you backfill around it, and importantly you would put some protection over the top to protect it from scour or ships dragging their anchors or that sort of thing. In essence, that's the process of an immersed tube tunnel. Why would we choose an immersed tube tunnel? Why do I think it's relevant to a tram crossing of the Thames, for example? Well, there are some distinct characteristics which uh, are attractive. If, if we just imagine we, we want, wish to cross the River Thames in this area, um, we could do it as the bridge, couldn't we? Well, the fundamental issue with a bridge um, would likely be you would have to clear shipping um, we get big ships around here, as you'll be aware. That means the bridge has to be high. That means the bridge has to be long. So we could, we could do a conventional board tunnel underneath it. We could um, create something, uh, again, or to, be, to be a board tunnel, you need a reasonable amount of ground above you to ensure stability. So that means the tunnel has to be quite deep in the middle. And much like the bridge, because we don't want the approaches to be too steep, you end up having very long approaches. So the board tunnel is almost the inverse of the bridge solution. But an immersed tube tunnel is attractive because it's built just in the river bed. It's shallow, so it doesn't have to be as, as deep at the centre of the river. And in consequence, the approaches can also be relatively short while, uh, while retaining the same gradient. And that means that, of course, there is fundamentally less work to do. There's less cost involved, less carbon involved, um, and, and so on. 
So these are well-proven technologies, and in these sort of situations, they can be very efficient solutions. Having said that, we, we have surprisingly few of these structures in the UK, which is why it's a little bit of an unusual thing to, uh, to talk about. But we do have three at the moment. They're all highway tunnels, uh, and one of them is quite close to us here at Medway. So the, uh, the drawing there shows you, just in, in sketch form, a plan view of the Medway tunnel, and the three slightly pinky sort of sections in the middle are actually the immersed tube lengths. So it, the Medway tunnel is fundamentally built of three of these tubes connected together and then connected to separate approaches either side. So there is precedent uh, and experience. But actually, if we look globally, there's far more precedent. Um, so if you'll excuse me, a, a page I nicked out of one of our marketing documents. This is actually just a graphic which shows the places where our company has been involved in delivering immersed tube tunnels in uh, this century so far. And you can see from that that it's, uh, it's a widespread solution geographically. It's used in many parts of the world. Um, over 30 projects that, that we've done to date. So, while relatively unusual in the UK, we're, we're confident in the experience. Just, just three examples to, to give you a, a bit more feel for what this sort of thing is like. Um, this is actually quite an old one, but I think it's, it's relatively local. Uh, this is Limerick on the, um, far, on the, yeah, the River Shannon, as someone saying, far side of uh, Ireland. Um, the picture at the top, shows you this rather nice aerial view of the crossing and I, I think you see quite nicely in that picture that the actual the tunnel portal where the, the underground section starts is actually very close to the river and that just ni nicely demonstrates the principle that uh, you can make the tunnel relatively short and therefore efficient to get across. The picture at the bottom is just taken during construction and that's actually one of the sections of that tunnel being floated out into position. So the, that's a, effectively a, a concrete box with the ends sealed off. And it's floated uh, in such a way that it, you're only seeing the very top of the box there. Most of it is below the water. So that's probably a broadly comparable scale of, of project to crossing the Thames, albeit a tram is far more space efficient than a highway. So you could do it with a much narrower box. Going across to the far side of the world, this is a, a recent project in South Korea. Um, but it's, it's a rather longer scheme, but I picked it partly for the, uh, the nice picture there of the concrete sections before they actually are towed out and put in place. So you see they're constructed in the dry. The black strips you see on the end are basically rubber seals that will uh, help seal between the units when it's placed and those will be float or were floated out to form the, the finished tunnel. And a third example, if we go to the, the extreme, um, or the current extreme of this, this is in construction at the moment, this is Fermanbelt Belt between Denmark and Germany. Um, so this is an international connection, a very large scale project, it's about 18 kilometres I think under sea. And this is a multimodal transport solution in the sense that we have heavy rail and we have highway provision within the tunnel. And you see in the cross section there the way it's, it's configured. So this is a scalable technology, river crossings upwards essentially. So just a couple of thoughts though about um, the future. The, the, everything I'm showing you in those previous pictures is established technology. We essentially, as an industry, we can do all that. What are our challenges? Is, is it a mature technology? Is there any more to do? Well, we've heard various um, comments about cli climate change, carbon and so on already today. Really, I, I would put it to you that the biggest challenges ahead of us now 
are around uh, those issues of carbon, climate change, and so on. This is a graph we've been using for in lots of projects at the moment. It's simply a, a time history of global carbon emissions. The green line, rapidly climbing, is is the historical record up to the present day, and the the red and the blue scenarios going forward are what we need to achieve in terms of global carbon emissions to get to one and a half degrees of warming, which is a, a widely used measure. And you can see from the shape of the graph, it, it's not a subtle change. We have to dramatically change our behaviour. That's probably the biggest, well, undoubtedly actually the biggest challenge for the sorts of technologies involved in most types of tunneling, certainly in the immersed tubes. The, the big problems for carbon are in the materials we use, we use lots of steel, cement, diesel fuel. Those are all big sources of embedded carbon. And if we compare where our industry is now with where it needs to be in five years, ten years, we are looking at step changes in those issues around fuels and core materials. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, but a lot of this is is developing fast. Lots of people would say these are things that should have been developed previously, but they're certainly now getting lots of traction. And they will affect how we deliver these things. Then there are some other related sustainability issues. Um, in the UK, we are much more aware of things like biodiversity um, than we used to be. We're more aware probably of heritage. Uh, than in many locations, and, and those are all considerations which are relevant around the Thames. So these would be focal areas, I think. But again, they are, they are problems we are working with and developing now, so we're in a relatively positive place in relation to them. So in conclusion, really, sort of three thoughts out of that which um, I wanted to share. <laughs> And the computer doesn't want me to share, clearly. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say that uh, I think we can legitimately take a lot of confidence from the experience and the knowledge we have of working under the River Thames in various places. We, we have mature solutions um, for them. Whoa. Oh, briefly, if you're quick. <laughs> I think the big issues for the industry going forward are these issues of um, sustainability, carbon and so on. We're working on these things now. We can see ways forward. It's certainly not a bad news story, but they are big challenges in delivering infrastructure. Um, and, and more locally, if I wanted a quicker way home, I think an immersed tube is a very good, sound proposition for doing that. And the last picture was just one I kind of couldn't resist from some of my colleagues. Um, that's uh, sailing an immersed tube tunnel section across Sydney Harbour. <laughs> Thank you.